Looks like you're on as well. Hey, Jigger. I think most of the group knows uh, Dr. Jigger Patel, Chief Medical Officer of Cerner, is joining us today. Um, we wanted to make sure that we let the team know Dr. Kershaw has um, left Cerner, moved on to a different opportunity, and uh, Dr. Patel graciously accepted to join us to listen and help advocate for us and collaborate with Cerner. So thanks for joining us, Jigger. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mandy. Great. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're about three minutes after here. Uh, uh, appreciate everybody for joining today. We've got a, a couple items that I think we at least had on the agenda, and then we'll certainly open up for any discussion or anything like that. Uh, so I think today we are looking at starting, uh, and from our last discussion in August, we started getting into the future orders discussion and orders to scheduling. And I think we wanted to get into a little bit more of that with the meeting today. And Dr. Patel, if we could maybe get some of your insights into some of that as well. Uh, I think we wanted to be able to talk about some of our concerns and frustrations with some of the, the pieces of functionality with that and some of the workflows that the, the different facilities are experiencing. And uh, like I said, get some of your feedback on that. And then uh, we need to give you some of that so you can take it back within Cerner and the development organization and maybe come back with some, some thoughts around that as well. Um, and then the second part we'd like to spend with our innovation session, uh, Dr. Clay Callison wasn't able to present at the last one, uh, but he's here. And so we wanted to, to present with some of the innovations that's going on at the University of Tennessee Medical Center. And we'll give him about a half hour to do that. And then if we have any time there at the end, we can go on to some of the just open discussions or general roundtable items that anybody has that they wanted to discuss. Uh, is there anybody on who hasn't been on one of these meetings before? Uh, I know besides Jigger. <laughs> hey, Brian, this is All Tiffany right. Cross with Covenant Health. And oh. technically speaking, I haven't been on, but here I am. Well, thank you, Tiffany. Do you just want to do a quick introduction? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Tiffany Cross, and I'm informatics officer for Covenant Health. And I um, support our ambulatory practices and all of our diagnostic services for both acute and ambulatory. So thank you for having me today. Great. Well, thank you for joining. And Christy, I see that you joined. Thank you. I'm glad <laughs> to see you're still alive. Christy has been working a, a go live at Northside for the past, I think, three or four weeks now, but <laughs> working every day. So I'm sure she is quite tired. Thanks for joining. All right. Um, so I wanted to, to open up the floor here to talk about some of our future orders and that orders to scheduling and some of the discussions that we had from last time. Uh, and just allowing Dr. Patel to be able to hear some of those conversations that we've had. Uh, I know Dr. Wu, you were involved in some of those discussions last time. Uh, Dr. Halford, you were as well, Dr. Khalid. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that uh, you guys had a chance to talk about some of the things you did from last, uh, that we talked about last time, and then anybody else as well who wants to talk about uh, any of their thoughts around future orders or orders to scheduling. Somebody wants to kick it off with that. I think if I recall from the last discussion, we had people in different places. Some people were using future orders. Some people were um, had had it in place for a little while and have done some optimization. And then others were considering um, both for future orders and orders to scheduling. So I don't know if we do we want to start with maybe does does everyone use it today or just a reminder of kind of round table where we're at at Covenant, we have future orders on for ambulatory, not for the hospital or emergency room encounters, and we do use orders to scheduling at, uh, at multi-facilities. At UT, we use it in ambulatory. We have a version of orders to scheduling. It really goes, it's more like orders to message basket that then gets scheduled due to uh, how about everybody kind of the, uh, issues with centralized scheduling. Oh, Dr. Callison, I think you're on mute again if you're talking. Uh, I could hear you. Clark. I can hear him. Okay, I can hear him. <laughs> Sorry. 
Maybe I have a bad connection <laughs> or something. Be me. So in Concord, we use um, future orders from the ambulatory setting as well. We use orders to scheduling for um, diagnostics, uh, radiology, that kind of thing. We do not use it for uh, surgical scheduling, chapeau. This is Dr. Wu at Murray Regional. Um, we are using future orders in the ambulatory space as well. We are using uh, orders to scheduling for radiology, and we do use chat book for surgery scheduling. Great. This is, uh, uh, this is Chris at, at Penn State. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so we have uh, future orders turned on for radiology studies in all venues. Uh, we default the detail value field in the ambulatory setting to future yes, and in the inpatient and ED setting to no, but they have the capability of switching that um, in all venues. Um, our challenge is um, the logistics of arranging the patient requested time to the radiology requested time and we've got a really clunky workaround with a dual messaging function that the home clinic arranges uh, the logistics with the patient prior to the radiology tech scheduling we've been trying to push the radiology tech centralized scheduling to have the direct communication with the patient, but frequently that is challenged because not infrequently in our academic center for specialists, the images in the future are tied to future appointments. And we have some both process and technology disconnect between appointments, uh, linking or imaging and scheduling uh, visit Tiffany, do you want to elaborate Thank on some you. of the struggles we've had at Covenant? Some of the challenges is kind of similar in, in the fact that um, how do you fill out the, the correct facility and, and uh, get it aligned with the actual scheduled appointment? Yes. So um, we do use um, future orders and we do um, use orders to scheduling and um, a lot of those are um, diagnostics for imaging. And um, a lot of the problems that we have, we use performing locations since we're multi-facility. So let's say, for example, um, you know, you're picking a CT and you want the patient to have it at our Park West facility. You have to choose that as the performing location. Well, one of that, if you know the process is done perfectly, then it works pretty well. But where it gets a little difficult is, let's say you've already placed that order and you've put Park West in as the performing location, and then the patient tells you after the fact, "Oh, I forgot. You know, I'm going to be at X place whenever I, you schedule that. Could I have it at another facility?" You can't edit that order. You can't go back and modify it and edit that performing location and just change it to another facility because then it doesn't go to the orders to scheduling queue. It just goes to the unknown queue and kind of gets lost in translation. And then that requires the provider to have to cancel it and reorder it, which is not a, a you know, a great workflow um, at all. But um, now we haven't had any trouble with them linking up to, to imaging studies. So I was curious for the person that um, mentioned that if they use RadNet as well. Yeah, this is Chris. Uh, I think you described our challenges better than I did. Um, we do use RadNet. The reason we could go to future orders is because we converted from a third party to RadNet. Um, but our challenges are coordinating the two schedules from a process end. And when the patient, when we schedule and the patient wants to change or cancel or no show, that whole uh, reorder activity is a uh, is a less than satisfying piece for everybody involved. Yes, agree. And the no-show process is, is difficult in, in the scheduling um, 
venue as well. It's just it's just a hard process, but it does make for um, a lot of duplicate um, workflows that have to occur. Yeah, for us, I mean, similarly, it's the if something has changed, whether it's location or whether it's the date or whether it's kind of various things within that order itself, um, not going back to the to the kind of queue to be worked on is that's that's where we've had our problems um, with patients either not showing for their appointment or sh showing a month too early for their appointment or something like that. So we've had similar challenges. And one thing just for for Jigger to hear as well, that queue that it goes into in um, in the scheduling um, solution, Jigger is one big queue. So you can't split it out. You can't like say like this facility work yours, this facility work. Yours. It's everybody's is in one queue. So it makes it really difficult to even if you if you even if you had it in the one queue, but you could split it out, it would still be better a little bit and more manageable but you know obviously the best thing would be if when you modify the order it then is um, has this the smarts so to speak to go to the right queue for the right facility and i think the reason we wanted to discuss it today was um, most of us, it sounds like, have tried to mitigate these risks through re-education and process flow, um, but uh, we really feel like that there's some work that needs to happen from a functionality perspective and, um, you know, would, would welcome an opportunity to be able to do that with the right contacts from Cerner at, at some point in the future. Yep, I got you, Mandy. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your feedback. Um, I will, um, uh, Brian, I think you're, you're running the meeting. Are there, are there notes that come yeah. out of this meeting? Um, okay. If you could send those to, oh, I, I'm on the distribution now, I think. Obviously I'll, I'll follow up. Uh, I would like to dig into this more, um, from a, you know, individual perspective. It sounds like a couple issues that I've written down here. Um, logistics of patient scheduling. Um, the rework queue, as, as Tiffany mentioned, um, those are a couple of the main things. So one is a little bit of a people process thing, and then another, the other is the functionality. So uh, yeah, I'll uh, keep talking, please, and any other feedback would be appreciated. So there's I would, a yeah, one of the hospitals on that didn't speak, and I wonder if Dr. Halid and if Dr. Scarborough haven't spoken yet about their processes. You know, I'm so sorry. I'm maybe like some of y'all. I'm uh, the Scarborough. You know, let you see my ugly mug here. Uh, I'm trying to do two meetings at the same time. So, uh, if you can pretend I didn't hear the question. <laughs> then I'll try to give you my input from my tiny little hospital in Kansas. Just whether or not you're using uh, future orders and orders to scheduling and difficulties that you're having and if they're different from those that have been expressed already. And as far as procedures or inpatient to outpatients or. Mainly people are using it for diagnostics. Well, you know, we were just talking about that in this other meeting about like uh, bone densitometry. So we have somebody admitted, maybe this is, hopefully this is a good example, but somebody admitted for a fragility fracture, but we need to get scheduled to, um, you know, bone densitometry in three to six months. And it's, uh, it's not as easy as it should be. Um, we're basically having to refer to either an outpatient provider or the care coordinator to follow up later and then do it. And um, you know, some of that may be insurance driven at some level, but I don't, I don't really think so. Like that's not one that needs prior authorization or, is that helpful? We're, we're using a people process to, you know, set reminders to do it later, prompting people to enter orders manually. You're spot on. 
and uh, we understand the challenge of doing multiple meetings with, with uh, <laughs> virtual. They think they yeah. can just cram in more all day. <laughs> just shows so how, how important we are, how many meetings we're invited to. Right. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> I just before oh, we cool. move off the topic. <laughs> Yeah. Dr. Halid, did you have anything else to add from Sidra? No, thank you. Um, I think uh, this is like a good meeting, you know, like for um, for sharing the knowledge and uh, learning from each other. But I have nothing to add. Thank you. So maybe what we can do is we've got a couple processes here. What we can do is we can work those up. Maybe Dr. Halford, we can go put that into the same format as we did for the meds rec discussion. And then we can go uh, get that to you, Jigger, and you can take that back to your team and come up with some responses on those. And then we can maybe talk about that at the next meeting. Hey, this is uh, Grace Wu at Murray Regional. I have, I, I wanted to sort of switch subjects along the same line makes any sense, but someone had mentioned chat book for <laughs> surgery scheduling, and I just wanted to see um, what was going on at other places because, you know, it's not uncommon, e even though we have tried to teach our surgeons to enter the order for the surgery that they want to schedule, it oftentimes goes in as a verbal order from the nurse. And so um, that cues chat book to schedule um, the process of scheduling ends up putting the surgery order into power chart. But if, um, if the surgeon doesn't input that order himself, then there is no way to get that power chart order sent to him or her to co-sign. And I wasn't sure if anyone else had a better process in place um, or if they're encountering similar issues. Our surgeons refuse to order surgery. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but we're still, the office is calling to schedule. And then once the pre-registration encounter is created, then the doctor goes on to plan their multi-phase power plan, but we're not using the specific order to schedule surgery. That's what we're doing as well. Is that Chris? Neither is Penn State. Penn State's doing the same thing. Yeah, something similar in Concord as well. So what I'm hearing is that the procedure, the order for um, laparoscopic appendectomy doesn't ever make it into power chart for you guys? Nope. No. Okay. No. So then the, I guess, how is the surgeon's request to schedule? I guess I'm just wondering from a compliance issue on our end because none of these orders are getting co-signed but from what I'm hearing from you guys that's a non-issue because the power chart orders for the surgery are not ever being placed so uh what it and surgeon at scheduling though you know there are uh, safeguards to say surgeon x has privileges to do um operations a b c d so that, that's how we say that we stay within our um, guardrails, but it's the, uh, there, it's the surgeon's office calling our surgery scheduling department to schedule the surgery. Now, we certainly are not going to perform anything, not in PAT or on the day of surgery, without the surgeon's orders. And uh, that includes, you know, the additional information on what they say they're consenting the patient for. Okay. And in right. addition, addition to verbal, addition to verbal, we actually we do we've done a lot of messaging, before, and and we did this a long time ago before all this orders to scheduling stuff was even a possibility. Uh, we created uh, smart templates in e-messaging, where they e-message the scheduling pool uh, to go start all the logistics of the pre-procedural activity. Much of it, at least in Pennsylvania, requires pre-auth. So. Um, you have that whole process prior to actually uh, booking and, and confirming. All 
All right, guys, thank you. That helps. If you can figure out how to get them to do it, though, please let us know. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> We're at Concord. We're piloting something uh, that that is, I, I think, might be a good alternative to it. We're we're instead of the order for the um, for it, for each operation that can be done, we created one generic request for surgery scheduling order that has a free text field on it where the surgeon can dictate in the actual procedure that they're doing rather than the surgeonette name, which often doesn't correspond to the, to the surgery they're doing or doesn't include everything they're going to do. And then there are some other required fields for other data that a surgical scheduler needs to be able to book the operation. So they place that one order, and that order is actually an, an appointment, a future appointment scheduling order. The um, and it goes to a queue and rev cycle. The surgical scheduler picks it up in in the queue, uses the information to send the to fax the paper surgery request form, which is which, which is how they're actually getting the information to the hospital scheduler. And then they use that appointment um, order to to place an appointment on the surgeon's schedule for the day of surgery that corresponds to how much time they're going to take. So it puts it on the surgeon's ambulatory organizer. So it kind of accomplishes the same thing and it has a surgeon's signature on it. Just started doing this last week at one practice. So Mandy, that's similar to what we do for procedures, right? For like our IR procedures and other um, things like that. We do a very similar process to what Concord just explained. Correct. So keep us, uh, let us know how it continues to go. Yeah. How are you guys, Paul, when you're doing, getting your procedurals on your ambulatory organizer, maybe everybody else is doing this, but us. We've tried very hard to get procedures on ambulatory organizer, but it always screws up our fins. Um, so we always have bad fins that go there. So whether it's a, a made up fin or a wrong encounter that people end up documenting on. Have, how talk, have you guys got around that? You're talking about surgical uh, operation, operations in the OR? Yeah, so I mean, for like, for example, in my, if we do it for like GI and pulmonary, I would kill to have like my three bronchoscopies this morning, I would kill to have them on my ambulatory organizer. And we tried that with our GI docs and we basically, we did it and we kind of pushed it through, but it was giving, it was the wrong fin on the ambulatory organizer and it was creating kind of dummy issues. So oh. the documentation was getting all messed up. So in our, our surgical procedures are, are, and things like bronchoscopy too, are booked in shaft book. And the, okay. the hospital scheduler, um, when they're scheduling an operation, they create two fins. One is for pre-surgical testing and one is for the surgery itself. And by way of scheduling the procedure, that actually creates an order. So they, it goes into the non-categorized section in, in, in the order. So it actually creates the order for the surgery they're scheduling. Yep. And um, that that puts the encounter, the, that puts the, that puts it on the surgeon's ambulatory organizer in our, in our system. Just by virtue of it having been scheduled in shaft book. Okay, because we have issues with multiple, with, with ambulatory organizer across the board, quite honestly, when you have multiple visits scheduled that are kind of out there in the future and trying to, the wrong visit sometimes shows up on the ambulatory organizer. Are we the only place that has that issue? Boy, that's never happened here. I don't know about other, other right. places. Because we've engaged Cerner and it's been a, oh, that's kind of, Kind of what happens is what we're told. So um, I'll ask I'll <laughs> ask our uh, rep cycle people they who really know more about the glitches and errors that we have. But okay. that's not something I've heard of. Okay. Well, we at Murray haven't had issues, to my knowledge, of the wrong fin being on the ambulatory organizer. Okay. Procedures. And I think it's time we you're relooked testing, at that. You're then. testing my yeah, I was saying you're testing my historical knowledge, but I, I remember something in the distant past around that. And I want to say it was related to Cerner's quote unquote best encounter logic, unquote, and a preference yes. related to that, but don't don't quote me. Okay. All right. Well, 
something that sounds like we need to dig that one back up then. Thank you. All right, are there, uh, is there anything else on the orders to scheduling or future orders that we wanted to talk about? Since, since Jigger's here, I'd, I'd love for uh, him to be able to provide with us a, uh, a Cerner recommended workflow uh, on uh, future orders related to radiology and systems that have Cerner scheduling and RADnet. Um, cause I know there's probably been recommendations and they throw around the word model a lot recently, uh, but I'd be interested in a, in a, in a detailed sort of best design approach, uh, for that. Cause yeah, my guess is we probably since we've implemented it, we probably have not kept up with the most recent recommendations. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, get uh, get some information. I'm um, based on it. Sounds like the information you're looking for would be on the model um, pages from a recommended workflow perspective. But I'll uh, I'll I'll dig that out. Thanks, Jacob. All right, is there any other items that people wanted to bring up uh, and discuss here as a round table or as part of a larger group? Uh, Dr. Snyder, not to put you on the spot, but I know uh, Dr. Clark had asked, uh, and I don't think he's on, but uh, he was working with some of the well sheet groups there uh, or working with well sheet, and one of the items that he had there was uh, seeing if there were other organizations that were interested in getting access to the I's and O's via FIRE. Um, and I'm not sure if you had any other information yeah. on that or if you kind of understood the context behind that, but I just want to throw that out to the group, though. I can I can give a, a little bit of background on that, just that um, one of the frustrations that, that we've had and uh, from since in the three years since we went live with Cerner is it's practically impossible to to figure out what the eyes and nose of your patient patient are um, and uh, so we've asked the well sheet people who've been who've been working with us with some innovative uh, ways of displaying the information in the chart that make it easier for users to see what's going on with their patient we asked them to see if they could give us a better INO um, display and I think that long story short is that is that um, they can't bring it in via fire or or I don't know there there's some obstacles to Cerner uh, working with them to to be able to bring the I know information in in a in a in a different display. Yeah, this yeah, this is Andy Laughlin. I would echo. Um, what Paul stated. I believe this has been escalated up through Cerner, but the issue with the um, with the INO through Wellsheet and through Fire is really how it comes out of Cerner um, and the inability to get that in a meaningful way through the um, API. Um, so I believe there's been some escalation of that through Cerner, but we haven't really had any luck in terms of uh, pulling that over through the Wellsheet app. Yeah, eyes and nose have been a real challenge in Cerner. I mean, it's especially for especially in the, like the NICU, for example. I mean, I, I it's like a weekly email from the NICU is like because at least in my world, I'm like, okay, you know, I want a diuresis leader, and you know, for 957 versus you know 1,003, it's you know close enough for government work. But I mean, when the NICU is like every they count like every milliliter, and I mean, they live and die based on their eyes and nose, and it's just we've not ever been able to create something that looks good for them, and something like that with Smart on Fire that is a a very nicely done display for them uh, would be life changing. Agreed. 
Jigger, is that something that we could get written up uh, and that you can maybe take that one for us as well? I know uh, Paul said Yeah, that absolutely. That okay. Yeah, Brian, I think, you know, part of the, and I've talked to a number of folks that are on the development side from a smart fire perspective, especially in um, from Cerner partner perspective. And um, fire is evolving still is part of the answer, right? Uh, many of these companies are using still some proprietary APIs to get information out of not just Cerner, but other systems um, because the fire spec is not fully um, realized yet and is in process and is, you know, various draft standards, yada, yada, yada. So there's there's issues ongoing with the, what the fire standard is. Um, I would want to understand from a INO output perspective, um, some of the issues that were described here. Um, and then um, again, if you have very specific, if you have specifics and I'm, I'm, well, I'm not well aware, but I'm aware of, of the, the NICU type of use case, which is very exacting. Um, you're absolutely correct on that. Um, yeah, if you catalog them for me, I'll, 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 I can get some digging done and, and pull some and bring some people to bear on what uh, this looks like. Um, uh, just because I've experienced interacting with a number of these folks, especially on the smart fire side. Great, appreciate it. Um, so if anybody on the call has any of those specifics they would want to send me, I know we've got some of them that you've mentioned here, but if you have others, go ahead and send them to, to me and Patty, and we can get those uh, collated and put together and then sent over to Cerner. Great. Uh, so I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for you, Dr. Callison, to be able to, to talk. Uh, but before we switch over to you, uh, is there anything uh, that anybody else wanted to discuss? Mine's definitely not 30 minutes worth of, worth of information, so. All right, well, uh, we'll give people a chance to, to think if they have anything, and then we can go back to others there at the end. But you should be able to, to go ahead and display if you have any slides or anything like that. Okay. Let's see here. Let's see if I can share my screen. Yep, we can see it. I don't want that. Sorry, my uh, you got me this fancy new monitor. Um, it's like this Cisco something or another, and it pretty much is a great monitor, but it decides it wants to act like a computer sometimes too uh, and take over. So anyway, all right, can you all see it? Okay. Yep, we're seeing identification and right. documentation of incidental. So, perfect. So really, um, so what I'll talk to you about today is one of the things that we've been working on this last year from a quality improvement standpoint, um, trying to figure out how to um, identify incidental findings um, for our patients in the hospital. This was really determined to be a significant um, issue from a medical, legal, and just patient care standpoint, kind of the incidental findings, um, kind of what we did, what we've done done to help with that uh, and move forward. So um, obviously most of you all obviously know what incidental omas are. Um, it's, we just happened to get a CT scan. And even though we're not looking for a specific thing, we happen to find something that's incidentally found that now it's, I ordered the CT, so now it's my responsibility to make sure something happens to follow it up you know a uh, frequent for us at least in my world from a pulmonary standpoint is going to be the the uh kidney kidney nodule or the adrenal nodule or the thyroid nodule that then even though it doesn't fall into the world of pulmonary is now mine to kind of take over and kind of do with as i need to um and so kind of how do i ident identify these in the hospital and what do i do with those um and so we've been working with our trauma team um, and really, if you look at the trauma literature, it's really quite scary that really 25 to 60 percent of CT scans done for trauma patients have incidental findings discovered um, that then need to be followed up in some way, shape or form or fashion. And so uh, UT, we did 6,500 trauma scans. Um, so kind of the trauma gram in 2018. So if you imagine, let's say conservatively, a quarter of those had incidental findings on it. That's a lot of patients that had incidental findings that some of which may be significant and some of which may not be. Um, but um, oftentimes, you know, some of these things are uh, early cancers. And even though they may be relatively 
uh, benign right now in two years, they, they could kill you. So trying to identify those and, and go from there. Um, so really what we did was retrospectively, um, really only 64% of our incidental findings on our trauma service are reported to patients and documented um, to them. So we were missing 35% of our trauma patients, despite, I mean, what I would consider, you know, efforts on the part of our trauma coordinator to be able to do this. And that's just the trauma service. I mean, you get a hospital with service. I mean, you get 70 year olds admitted to the hospital all the time. And, you know, they've had 70 years worth of time to develop incidental findings. And so the um, question is, how do you how do you work through that process? And what does that standardized workflow look like to capture them? Um, all right. And so kind of, I mean, from training standpoint, for me, it was kind of, if you ordered it, it's your responsibility and somebody, you know, nobody else's job to follow it up. And, you know, traditionally speaking, that's been the case. The problem is, is, um, you know, it's the resident, it's the nurse practitioner, it's the attending, kind of who does that fall to? And oftentimes if you're taking care of them in the hospital, you're not the person who's following them up in three months or six months or six weeks or a year with the follow-up scans with that. So we got to make sure that is coordinated across the continuum of care um, as patients leave the hospital. So, I mean, frequently, you know, okay, great. I've got a, I've got a solitary pulmonary nodule. You know, you may not have looked at that initially because it was buried in my problem list, but that was that's something that needs to be followed up on. Um, you know, in this note here, it doesn't really indicate it, but oftentimes they'll kind of indicate something down here, you know, needs follow-up CT scan in three months or something like that. But again, it gets lost in the list, laundry list of things that, that need to happen. So um, also, if you look at kind of when does imaging happen, well, the average, greater than 80% of all imaging for hospitalized patients happens within the first 24 hours of admission. But the average length of stay, at least for our facility, is five days. So there is a four plus day time difference between when the, when the incidental finding was discovered versus when the patient is discharged. And quite frankly, the person who did the admission oftentimes is not necessarily the one doing the discharge. So then you're having to cross it across, you know, to relay it across teams, which, you know, if you've played a game of telephone lately, you know how, how poorly that comes out. So really what we were working on was, um, you know, how do, how do we make sure this happens for all our patients? And they're kind of, if you're OCD like I am, you know, this, this is the stuff that keeps you up at night. Um, and I'm not a chief quality officer. Um, you know, that, that small spot does turn into, can, can turn into cancer if not dealt with early. And so um, I know we all, in the practice of medicine, this is the stuff that makes me nervous is, you know, you don't know in five years, are you going to get a letter and a lawsuit saying, hey, you know, what's going on here? I, I do thoracic oncology uh, as a hobby. And so, um, you know, it's not infrequent that I see patients in clinic who come in and, um, you know, on in hindsight, they've had a, had a CT in our system, you know, two years ago. And I could actually kind of see that little nodule that was there before that's definitely much larger now. Um, so I definitely know it happens. Um, so that small, small spot can definitely grow. And so what we did was we kind of looked at the overall process for this. We looked at the radiologists and what they're doing. Um, we looked at, um, hey, how can a provider document this? And we looked at documenting this in a power form. Um, which captures the incidental findings noted during the hospital stay for the patient during the transition of care and after discharge. Um, it we're able to document family discussion with this so that we can, um, you know, medical legally document this. Um, so it kind of covers us um, and really create a standardized process for documenting and communicating this for once they leave the hospital. Um, so the first part was if you guys have read radiology findings lately, um, these radiology reports can be extremely long. Um, and oftentimes what we found was there were little incidental findings that were in the very long body of the CT report. And so it was very challenging um, when you're very busy, you look at the impression, but a liver nodule or kidney nodule or lung nodule may not have been listed in the impression. It may be buried somewhere just in the, in the findings of, of the exam. And so what we did first off was worked with our radiology department to create an incidental finding section at the very, very end underneath impression. Um, and so basically by doing this, the definition of an incidental finding was the, at, mo at, at, at least it was something that required some sort of follow up. So, you know, if they've had, you know, hepatic steatosis, okay, I don't necessarily need to make that an incidental finding, but 
a thyroid nodule needing follow-up, eh, that definitely needs to be an incidental finding. You know, some radiologists take this a little bit farther and they list anything in there that is kind of of significance, they think, but they do they do specifically document what needs to be followed up so that, you know, people, um, you know, they include Fleischner Society recommendations in here too, to help some of these people know what needs to happen. So that was the first thing was being able to really pull out in the radiology reports what that is. And then we created a form uh, that is accessible in many, many different ways in the hospital, and it's called incidental findings. Um, and so we, doctors like orders, and so we made it so you can basically look it up in an order and launch the form. We also added it on various workflows. We uh, Here's the discharge workflow, but we also have it on the daily progress note dis, uh, workflow and all the inpatient workflows. And then we also put it on the DPART documentation um, down here as well, so that regardless of how kind of how you you slice and dice this, you in theory could get to it in any way. Um, here's can what I the form itself question, looks John? like. Absolutely. I'm sorry to interrupt. You can hold me off till the end if you'd like. No, please. Go um, ahead. Two things. Is your are you on Cerner Radiology or a different system? No, we're on G G E Radiology right now. Soon to be Fuji. And but we are okay. using Radnet for a lot of that for our actual imaging. Okay, and then um, second question: Is that a separate M page component titled "Incidental Findings"? Yes. So we kind of we cut you we kind of uh, created a custom M page section, and that we that we made it a required section for the discharge. Okay. Thank you. No, absolutely. Um, and so from here, you can also kind of click it to open up the form. And so we created a form and we created it so that you can, in theory, each incidental finding has its own section form. And then we had, I guess, what, five add-ons. We hoped that you did not need more than five incidental findings on a patient. And if you do, that is kind of telling anyway. Um, and so, but it's a required field. And so if you click no, no incidental findings were discovered, then you're done. And, but that way you've documented that no incidental findings were, were discovered. Um, but if you click yes, all these other conditional fields open up. And so um, when you when you do that, let's see, here we go. So then you can document who you discussed it with, what the finding was, who the follow up needs to be with, um, which we made that pretext as well. So that, you know, if it's just with primary care doctor, even though you don't know who it is, you can still put that in there. And then also recommended follow up testing um, with the recommended time timeline to go with it. Um, just so that way that could go with the patient that could go to the primary care doctor on, on discharge um, so they could have an idea for what that looks like. And so you basically would finish that and then you'd sign your form kind of like a typical form. Um, and then you could do multiple uh, multiple forms as well if you needed to for the number of incidental findings that you had. Um, you sign the form and then really at this point, um, what we decided was, was this form would carry forward within an, within one encounter, so within that hospitalization. In theory, from a workflow standpoint, if 80% of, of if imaging is done within the first 24 hours of admission, in theory, 80% of your incidental findings should be discovered during that first 24 hours, but that leaves four more days on average for them to be in the hospital. And so instead of putting the onus on the person at the very end to go back and clean up everything, if you found something, you went ahead. You're supposed to go ahead and document it at the time you find it. So that way, um, you know you're you're cleaning things up and keeping things tidy for the next person that comes behind you. Um, and that's frequently what happens. That's what trauma has done to standardize their workflow is on the admission process. That's what they do. Um, and when they do this, it automatically will populate the clinical summary, which goes to the primary care doctor. It automatically will pull to the patient summary, which the patient receives and signs a copy of. And it pulls as a smart template into the discharge summary as well. So it'll go to all the various people without anyone having to think about having to insert it in there. So as long as somebody does the work up front, it'll automatically populate all the areas downstream. Um, we also had to have it uh, documented uh, in the flow sheet as well. So we're still a flow sheet centric uh, facility since we've had Cerner since like 1997. Um, and so um, we are slow in page adopters. And so we do have it on the flow sheet. And so, um, for example, we have it so that you can see, hey, no incidental findings were discovered on this patient. And so it's very face up. But when one is, you'll actually see it face up on the flow sheet, which is how a lot of our primary care doctors 
uh, or seeing this in clinic afterwards. And then you just double click on it and it'll pull up in the form so you can see the various incidental findings that you had. Um, here's the discharge workflow and this is the flow sheet that we have. And so, um, you know, if you have no incidental findings, it'll show no, but if you do, it'll show them face up in the, in the workflow itself so that um, you can do this. And we, we do similar things for things like our advanced care plan and stuff like that so that things are face up in the workflow if they've been documented before. Um, and, but again, it's a required field, and so we have it set so that you really can't discharge the patient until, unless that, that is done um, as kind of a fail safe, which we recently did this in the ED. And even though they kicked and screamed about it for the first couple of days, um, we ignored them. And magically, the kicking and screaming has gone away, and they're documenting incidental findings on every patient, um, which I think from a medical legal standpoint and really patient care standpoint, that's a, a real win because so much happens in the ED. Um, here's an example of what populates. Yeah, has this been adopted. So it sounds like ED adopted it. I mean, widespread also house -wide. including specialists. Yeah, it's house wide. So to discharge somebody, it has to be done. Um, wow. In our I system, I applaud you for um, getting that to be adopted. Well, <laughs> I applaud well, you and, for and, the you widespread know, adoption. And and it really, I mean, it's and we just kind of, I mean, it, you know. Do people document erroneously very well? They may, um, but they they do. It is a required documentation, um, and so we did turn this off though for people uh, who just have surgical encounters because, in theory, hopefully you're not coming across an incidental finding um, while you're you know scoping them or something like that. But um, but yeah, so and this really came from specialists. It came from our surgeons initially was how it was discovered, and then we kind of moved it across through our physician's advisory council and then broadcast it everywhere. Um, but here's what shows up in the in the document for the patient um, here. So it, it shows up automatically. And then in our discharge summary, here's what shows up here. So it'll automatically pull in kind of those incidental findings in the discharge summary itself. So does it work? So we we did this with so traumas was very interested in this from a, a PI standpoint. So they actually went through the effort of actually doing a manual chart review on this. Um, and so that's the population that I'm choosing to report on here. Obviously, it impacts other populations, but I've not personally gone through and done a chart review of every patient in the hospital, but they did for trauma. Um, and so they did an 11 month chart review um, after they've implemented this. And they really took that in reporting to from around 50 percent where they initially were um, upwards of over 90 percent um, by using this. And so um, you know, does it work? It does work. Um, and so we've seen it in this situation. That being said, um, they found that they went, they got all the way up to 98.2% with, with post-discharge. When they saw these patients in clinic and were able to then look back, they were able to, to see it um, because they do follow them up. And that is one of the fields that they look for in follow-up in clinic. But 90% were done prior to the patient actually leaving our facility. Um, so really what we're working on at this point is really working on um, really improving the, the capture of the radiology reporting. So, um, you know, anytime you get a group of docs who, you know, they, they've been doing something the way they've been doing it for 30 years, it's hard to hard to change habits. And so we're working on more standardized templating with radiology. Um, but we also now um, recently um, worked on some smart templates to pull in radiology impressions. And with that, we also are able to do a smart template that pulls in this incidental finding section, if it is within a document so that we can kind of, when you're going to discharge a patient, you're able to pull in and quickly see all the incidental findings to make sure that you haven't missed something along the way while they've been in the hospital. Um, not that we, we don't necessarily put that in a document to send home, you know, no, incidental findings, none, incidental findings, none. But I think from a provider standpoint, it's kind of a, a quick hitter to make sure that, you know, if somebody hasn't documented none, and you're having to go back and do it at the very end of your, you know, a 30 day hospital stay. It's very easy to kind of pull up all incidental findings documentation that's been done in the radiology report and able to confidently say there have been no incidental findings discovered during this stay. So 
that's really all I had. Like I said, it wasn't 30 minutes worth of work, but um, you know, this has always been a challenge for us. Um, and it goes back to the, the old feeling that, Hey, if you order something, then you're responsible for it. We've been working on similar things with um, abnormal labs after discharge. Um, we've been working on a standardized process to capture those um, in a centralized fashion through our hospital, through quality improvement. Um, and actually I've been the physician champion for that and have actually, um, we have a nurse that reviews all, all abnormal labs after patients are discharged that return after discharge. And I kind of go through it from a QI standpoint. Um, and we've been reviewing that over the last 11 months since that's been live. I'm looking at, again, trying to figure out, hey, how many of these came back after discharge that were abnormal? And of those, you know, to the, all the provider, who needs to be, does a provider need to be notified? And if a provider needs to be notified, was action taken on that? For example, the urine culture came back positive and it was resistant to the augment and you gave them. Do you, you know, that prompted a change and trying to capture that information. So, so that's some of the QI stuff that we've been working on um, lately and how that relates to Cerner. So thank you guys for letting me present to you all. I have another question for you, John. This is Sandy O'Laughlin from Concord Hospital. Yeah. Um, do you guys use power forms for physicians and other um, situations? And can, just can you speak well, to yes, um, that? Yes, we do. So found that physicians, as you said, they like orders. And so we, yeah. I, we've toyed with the idea of using power forms for some things, but I wanted to hear your experience with that. So we do them on a few items. Um, and, and so there, there's not a lot of them, but we, the instances we do them on um, are this, for example, we also do it on our advanced care plan. Um, and so for patients, you know, who have an advanced care plan that crosses encounters, for example, um, we use power forms for that because it will automatically pull forward your last result um, so that you can, you know, update their code status or whatnot. And that way you have some discrete data. We, for example, on our advanced care plan form, it's very brief, but it includes code status on there. Um, as well as discussions surrounding that code status. And we actually have alerts built so that if I document somebody in my cystic fibrosis clinic as being DNR, but they come to the ER, there's a 100% chance that I will not be that person seeing them in the ER. Um, and so if they need to be intubated or, you know, but they're DNR, if somebody enters a code status order that differs from the one that we had documented on that advanced care plan form, an alert fires saying, hey, you need to go back and look at that. Um, you know, it may be appropriate, but you need to go back and look at that and talk with the patient or their family to, to have that discussion. So again, we use power forms a lot for things that kind of cross, um, cross encounters. We do power forms for our oncology history. So some of those things that again, cross encounters within the oncology world and across disciplines. Um, but we don't use a lot of them. And when we use them, they're very intentional and they have gotten significant physician buy-in prior to implementing them, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, this that's is great. great. Thank, Thank you. you. We also recently in a meeting this morning about, about incidental findings, so that's why this was timely. <laughs> so yeah, so happy to, yeah, happy to share whatever with you. This has actually worked, I think, pretty well. Um, you know, things always fall through the cracks, but I think we've definitely moved the needle to some degree um, on this. Dr. Callison, there were other requests for the um, PowerPoint to be shared as well. Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah, and this was going to be presented at like various conferences that have been, you know, keeps getting delayed and postponed and canceled. So this was like going to be at one conference that got canceled. So it was going to be at another conference that got canceled. And so at this point, <laughs> I've had it. All the can all the conferences have been canceled. So um, so anyway, so but uh, anyway, but and this is the sort of thing from an IT standpoint. This has been very helpful for our analysts um, because they don't see a lot of the clinical aspect to, to this as much and a lot of the wins that they participate in. They just kind of see it as, you know, they're just punching, punching buttons and punching numbers on the back end. And so things like this have really, I think, been invigorating to them to want to keep trying to find solutions for problems when they can see that it actually does help patients instead of just making doctors happy. Hey, this is Mark so Scarborough John, this is and Lawrence. Oh, sorry. Uh, Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, Mark. How you doing? It's good to see you again. Good to talk <laughs> to you. Good, how are you? Yeah. 
uh, how do you how are you driving? And I'm sorry if this is redundant. If you how are you driving them to engage in the power forms? Like I know uh, we so have a on, way so through, through workflows. Or yeah, you, so it's on the uh, workflow. So it's on the discharge workflow that it's a required field on the discharge workflow. Right. So you made that um, a required field. I guess I was wondering yes. like the other because um, that's and is that part of the custom work that you did or was that. Is that sort of standard in that discharge workflow that you can require that and, and that's you can require it. We I mean I hate to say we don't really do we don't do anything really that custom here. Um so anything I anything I say that's is good. custom. It's, I mean that's it's yeah. not really you that custom. You had some I mean, work with the custom input uh, I think maybe the custom I don't know if you use the the custom M page tool to do that, but but that's so you're driving it. That's a piece of relative. discharge. Yeah, so we have it in the workflow, and then if you use Depart at all, we made it. Or we we kind of made it the yellow thing on the on the Depart. So either or. If you, yeah, um, because we found that some people like to use Depart, and we, although we're really pushing them towards the workflow, some people still kind of hang out with the Depart, and so we wanted to draw there. Yeah. Um, and so we have it here as provider to complete because a lot of the providers were pushing it to the nurses. Oh, the nurse needs to complete that. That's not the case. And actually, interesting, on day one of this, um, a nurse called our uh, chief nursing officer because they had HIV on there as an incidental finding to, to discuss with the patient. Like, it was on there. And the nurse was like, what do you? And so, actually, what was scary? And so they, of course, to me, like, oh, you know, that needs to be better done. And I'm like, actually, that's a win. Because clearly, that wasn't going to be discussed with the patient at all. And the nurse happened to catch that because it was documented mm -hmm. on the incidental finding. So. It's actually quite scary, um, but yeah, so that's kind of how we've made it a part. So, but this is this is when they're doing the DPART process. I, you mentioned, and I agree, I mean, putting it as real time as you find it helps, yeah. you know, if you have a complicated stay and it's a, a long, then, I mean, I, I'm probably like the rest of you, how many times have you dictated a discharge summary and you're going through the reports, you're like, oh crap, I didn't, didn't see that until now. So, yeah. so putting that, further up how do you nudge them to to do that further in if you have it required at the DPAR process well and and so we've added it to all the workflows the HMP workflows the daily progress net workflows and then really a lot of this was just patient and so I do so I do a weekly email tip um, that goes out as kind of new things or kind of weekly tips that go out our chief medical officer uh, finally agreed to letting me do that um, and apparently that's the most that's the best way to get information out to our that is is in Wednesday email. Apparently, that's like all a lot of our people end up reading. Um, and so I've got I send all sorts of things in that in that email. It may not be IT related, um, but uh, we did that. So and every few months, I've kind of added that back. Um, just as hey, it's a reminder. It's part of the resident onboarding process now. Um, I meet with a hospitalist once a month, and so I remind them every few months to do that. Um, and I meet with a lot of our resident groups individually and tend to try to remember to keep that on my list of things to remind them about. Um, so uh, the trauma group, interestingly, when they were doing this review, they actually sent out letters to people who who, who did not disclose um, almost like a QI letter that you might get from from your hospital. Um, and they actually it was sent out an email format to the radiologist, to the discharging attending and to the discharging person on the discharge summary, um, which oftentimes was a resident or nurse practitioner. So they actually sent out that out all the way um, to really work on and drive that that improvement process. So John, this is great work. Um, thanks for presenting it. And um, I, I do think there's there's a couple questions I have for you. Yeah. Number one, what was the end on that that PI study from trauma? It seems like it would be potentially in the thousands, but um, it was. It was I want to say it was. It was like it was only like five hundred or something like that. I think. Um, okay. I can. Yeah, it was, or maybe it was eight hundred and something. Um, okay. I can look that up and, and and let you know. But yes. Yep. So a couple things I was thinking, and and the one. The one thing that you highlighted here that I would reinforce to this group is the little known function or the little known capability of an order launching a form. So in thinking through how do you get physicians to think about or this form, what you did there is very smart in that it it 
it's a place they go a lot, right? They do a lot of orders. Um, so linking it to an order so it has a workflow that starts with something that's familiar <coughs> as opposed to them starting someplace they don't. So I think somebody from Concord asked the question, how do you get them to think about forms from a physician perspective? This is a good mm -hmm. trick. Um, I've used a couple times myself, but others I know have used as well to try to make it easy, lower the, the burden of entry for physicians to use forms. Um, and if it's structured right, like you guys have done, that, that makes it very, very easy. Now, is there, John, what was your conversation or thought around codification? Because I know um, American Society for Radiology, um, ACR, uh, nah, American College of Radiologists, yeah, a codification ACR. scheme for incidental findings. Um, and it's not, I've tried to go down the licensing path with them for a client. Uh, they're not that easy to work with necessarily, but there are some codification schemes out there that uh, Millennium Today, to my date, to my knowledge, doesn't have. So um, that's another avenue. Uh, are you? How are you codifying these things? Or are you really just kind of pulling them out, free text, and it's really, um, but it's, it's really pulling out on the radiologist part. Um, so it's up to the radiologist yeah. to to put them there. Yeah. Yeah, so there's you know future thoughts on yeah. some of this, but um, great. and then the uh, the notification piece of this or the the tracking, I don't know mm -hmm. if maybe I missed it, but is do you have a report or something else that allows you to follow up and potentially, or, or do you leave it to the professional judgment of the individuals reading the discharge summary, primary care physician, et cetera? We really leave it up once they leave us, once they've been documented, once the, I mean because. Yeah. So we've not really followed them up. I mean, really, in theory, we could do that with our with our university health network, um, kind of more uh, ACO, you know, pop health, yeah. you know, brand. We could definitely do that with that. At this point, what we've pretty much done is said, hey, we've given it to the patient. We've docu we've, we've sent it to the primary care doctor and we've mm -hmm. documented the discharge summary. And we've discussed it with, with the patient or somebody else that should care. Um, and we've at this point kind of left it at that. So we've not actually followed this all the way through to, you know, did they get their follow up ultrasound or did they get their follow up CT scan? That in theory um, could be a great next step. Yeah. And, and that's one of, a, you know, some of the clients I've been working with recently uh, in the government space. That's they, they are following things to the end point to the nth degree. Yeah. Um, and so we always had to think through. How do we codify number one? How do we for secondary use? And then secondarily, how do you follow up and close the process so that Thank it's um, student or resident proof? That's kind of the way yeah. they've phrased it. Um, because that's if you have a if you have a large number of those, if you do at UT, those are they rotate, right? And they yeah. move around. So it's hard to to manage that. That's a great idea. John, I have one more uh, clarif clarification question. Yeah. The template that the radiologists are using, um, is that just to call out the incidental findings as part of the report, or did you say that is is automatically pulling in somehow? So that is that that's just part of their report that they that they include that in their standard template and they put that below the impression. So it's kind of at where the end user who would look at it. We have created smart templates in in Cerner though to pull this information out. So we have smart templates pulling out, you know, the impressions from our radiology reports that you can put into your notes. And so we did create a smart template, similar type thing with the start word being incidental finding and the end word being kind of the end of the end of that radiology report. So that again, not that we're creating a note with incidental findings alone by them, but it's kind of a nice quick hitter for people that have been in the hospital for a while. And you're asking the, you know, the hospitalist to review 30 days worth of incidental findings. That's kind of fraught with disaster. So we did this more for them to be able to kind of call in that, that incidental finding smart template so that you can at least make sure that there's nothing that you've missed. And the smart template pulls the text from the report or pulls the yes. form documentation? It, it pull, pulls the text from the report, the radiology reports. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, kind of, yeah, kind of and like we do with our John, radiology smart templates right now. Yeah, for clarity, you're using the RadNet tool for creating radiology reports, correct? Correct. 
So there's for everybody else here, you, and this is a, a, a pain point I run across a number of times. Um, it depends on what they're using, right? If they're driven a if you're doing a PAX driven workflow yeah. and they're often having a separate transcription or a different reporting tool, that's that smart template isn't amenable. But if you're doing RadNet report creation, then yeah. that does come into a separate section. It can be reported from a smart template perspective. So there's some nuance there from a design yeah. perspective. And really, the smart template was um, more of just that we literally started doing that two months ago. So we didn't have an analyst that knew how to do that up until recently. So that is brand new off the press. So that really wasn't included in a lot of what we've been doing. I just want to say it's really nice work. I, and I admire what you've been able to do. Thank you guys for letting us share it. And yeah, I'll definitely I'll send Brian the uh, the PowerPoint so you guys are happy to to take it and and do with it as you will to see if there it can be helpful in any of your all's hospitals. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll get that distributed. This is great. Yep. We appreciate the sneak preview <laughs> since you haven't been able to present it anywhere else. So I'm glad you could share this. <laughs> glad I was finally able to share this somewhat. <laughs> finally, yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, I know we're about 10 minutes over, though. Uh, is there anything else anybody wanted to, to bring up or put on the agenda for our December 9th meeting? All right, um, so there's a couple things here. Uh, we'll work on getting some future orders, orders to discussion workflow items over to Jigger. Uh, Jigger, I did see that you put in the, the text or the chat here, some of those links to the standard content. Thank you for doing that. We'll also put those in our notes that go out. Um, and then also, if anybody has any use cases for the, the I's and O's and uh, reason to get those in through the Fire apps, uh, send those to myself and or Patty Marshall, and we'll make sure that we get those included as well. We can get that off to Cerner for review also. Uh, but as always, uh, we'll send the meeting minutes out along with a link to where we store all of the materials online on our website. So if you want to go take a look at them out there, you can. Uh, but otherwise, if you have discussion topics for December 9th, I'd always appreciate those. We can get those onto the agenda, and then that way people can start to think about it ahead of time. Uh, that way, you, so you have a little bit of time to prepare. But thank you, everybody, for today's uh, participation and discussion. We had a really good turnout. Uh, appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, we'll get the same in December. Everybody, take care and stay safe. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Thank you.